Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Five. I am Pastor Steve, and I am just super excited that you've chosen to join us this morning as we spend a little time together digging into the Word of God, praying together, learning, studying, and growing in our faith. If you've been with us before on First Five, you know that every morning we read one chapter of Scripture together. And most recently, we have been working our way through the book of Acts. And so today, we continue that journey. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 12. And so my invitation to you would be that when we're all done the lesson, you take a moment and read the whole of Acts chapter 12. Good story. You're definitely going to want to see it and read the whole of the chapter. But for the purpose of our lesson this morning, we're going to look at just the very beginning of it. We'll look at just verses 1 through 5 that kind of set the groundwork, set the context for the rest of the story. And so, if you have a Bible handy, or if you're at your computer and you want to pull it up on your phone or your Bible app, I invite you to join me in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It was about this time the king Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Then, when he saw that this met with the approval of the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter as well. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So as I mentioned, we're just reading kind of the beginning of this chapter, just really kind of the introduction to the story. So you just really absolutely have to read the whole chapter. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. It is a powerful story of a, of a praying church and the miracles that God brought out of that and his miraculous freeing of Peter. And honestly, if we had the time, we would read the whole chapter, and there are at least five or six great, important teaching points in this story. But as I was reading the story for, the, for this morning, and, and I've read this story dozens and dozens and dozens of times, more than I could possibly remember, but as I was reading it this morning, something jumped out at me that that I hadn't really thought much about in the past. And that is the motivation of Herod. To give some historic context, at this time, the Romans ruled the known world. The powerful Roman army had conquered region after region, nation after nation, and including that was Judea, the nation and homeland of the Jewish people. And so what would happen is as the Romans took over a region, they would appoint a Roman ruler to provide oversight and to maintain control. And they'd be left with a small contingent of soldiers to, to keep everything under control. And a man named Herod was appointed to be the Roman king over Judea. And so his goal, his assignment, if you will, is to keep the people under Roman occupation, right? To keep them content, to keep them peaceful, and to keep them paying taxes to Rome with his little effort as possible without, without any uprisings or problems that would require more soldiers to be deployed. That was the goal of the king, was to keep the people happy and paying taxes. So, as the Christian church begins to emerge, Herod discovers how much the Jews hate the Christians, particularly 
the leaders of the Jews, the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, those who had the most influence among the people. Because Jesus had disrupted their system and their power and their authority and all that. So Herod begins to use the force and the brutality of the Roman soldiers at his disposal under his authority, if you will, to persecute Christians. Not really because Rome had the least bit of concern that, they, that the Christians posed a threat to the Holy Roman Empire, the powerful army, this, this tiny little movement of people who profess to love everyone and honestly who would never raise a sword against anyone. So it wasn't that there was fear on Herod's part. Herod does this. He brings this persecution simply because it wins the approval of the people. First, he puts James, the brother of John, to death. When he sees how much approval he gets from the Jews because of that, he turns his sight on other leaders within the church. And the next one, of course, would be Peter. Had he lived, Herod would have continued to put Christians to death. He died shortly after this, and you'll see that in the story. But had he lived, he would have continued to do that. Not because the Christians had done anything wrong, not because they were any great threat, but simply to gain the approval and the popularity. I know none of us would ever do what Herod did, but it is a good reminder that we must be attentive to our own motives and not allow what is popular to supersede what is right. Ultimately, let us not seek the approval of mankind, of human beings, but the approval of God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this story. It's in many ways a painful and sad story. And, and we see Herod begin to continue to amp up the oppression and the persecution of the Christians in the story. And he didn't do that because he thought they were really any great threat. He did it because it, got, it gained him approval, because it made him more popular among the people he was trying to rule. Lord, help us learn from that. Help us be reminded in this story that our goal ultimately is not to please other people, it's not to receive the approval of other people. It is to please you. And it is to receive your approval. Help us, God, to live our lives in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And I will talk to you tomorrow. God bless.